Kristen Boy. Hola, Rolandito. Maestro. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, in your own words, Maestro, what is Peral Music? Well, before, you s before I can say what it is, is why it is. Okay. Why? You know, <coughs> if you decide to do something like this, you do this either because your activities so far have been so terribly unsuccessful that you have to find a way to get out of it, mm. or your activities in the past have been so successful that you don't need your partners. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy to say that I don't belong to either category. <laughs> I am very happy to start a new venture, and I'm very grateful to Universal, who is represented here today by Max Hall, who will accompany me, if you want, uh, on this uh, adventure. For many years now, um, many people have said the record world is finished, always the same. With the pop it works because they always record new songs and new pieces. The classical repertoire is always recorded the same pieces and therefore uh, one cannot really expect to sell it and there's less interest in classical music, etc., 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 etc. You know, <coughs> I've been around for a long time. I made my first record uh, a little over 60 years ago, in 1954. In the I went to the Wigmore Hall in London and um, uh, recorded uh, three piano records, three of the little 45 mm -hmm. thing, uh, at that time for, for Philips. And then uh, I saw the discovery of the long playing record, of stereophonic, of quadrophonic, of what all the phonics of the world. <laughs> and it, it ending up in the CD, in the compact mm. disc. So I've seen all of this. And we have had really a very, very uh, great uh, development technically in how the recordings have been made. You mm. cannot compare, in fact, we have arrived at a point where on a CD you can play an old 78 recordings from the 20 1925 or 1930 and there is no noise. On the long playing record you still heard <coughs> but in the, in the CD is completely finished. And this may be part of the problem that suddenly all of us who were recording in the 80s were not only in competition with our own past and with our contemporaries, but back for so many years. Mm. And therefore, I had uh, many, many conversations and I thought, what, is it, what does the future, what will the future bring us? There must be something uh, uh, positive in the future. And the opinions were divided. Um, how long the CD will continue to live? Will there be a new life for it? Uh, when will the digital world come in? But in all the different opinions, regardless of the degree of pessimism of, or optimism in it, it was always clear that the future is the digital world. Mm. Maybe not quite now, not so quickly, think. but I thought if I'm going to really start something new, uh, I want to do it now. I don't want to do it as a reaction to something that happens because of a uh, situation or because of a crisis or because of uh, development of other uh, reasons. Because I was told, why do you want to do that? Because I said, I want to do it only digital. Mm -hmm. I don't, but they said you could really have a big success if you also... Uh, I said I'm not really interested. So in Peral Music is only digital? All, uh, per Peral is going to be only digital. And I'm not really um, uh, interested in playing a safe game. Mm -hmm. I want to take this decision 
towards the future. It, before anything else, it is a philosophical decision that says the future belongs to the digital world. The digital world, we can get better quality of sound mm. than we have now on the records and on the compact discs. And uh, uh, this is what I, I would like to do. And I would like to really put, as it were, all my efforts into the work of the future. Is your audience, the target audience, is expert listeners or is it also newcomers? I would hope uh, a bit of everything, mm. a bit of everything. You know, we have a, the, the main problem about all the music world is that there's no music education. And mm. when people say, ah, you don't see young people in the concerts, it's not true. Young people never were the majority <laughs> of the concerts. Um, and this, uh, but basically it's amazing that millions, millions of people go to concerts and go to the opera all over the world and they have no introduction to it. They don't know anything about it. They don't hear the music at home. They don't hear music in the kindergarten. They don't hear music. They don't learn anything about music at school. It's actually amazing. So this is in a way, the main problem with music and the world of today. But I think that the young people now are able to profit from a very much developed technological world, mm. which my generation, I think not even your mm. uh, generation has been able to profit from that. And maybe we have a way of uh, interesting them in that. Because one thing is clear for music, whether you play it, or whether you listen, you only get out of music as much as you give. Mm. When you sing, or I play, or when we listen, you have to give. Mm. You have to give of your concentration, you have to give of your curiosity, and you have to give of your will. Mm. You, t you cannot go to a concert hall or sit at home and put on a record or, uh, uh, or load it down and sit there passively and expect a miracle to happen and this marvelous music happens. It mm. doesn't happen. Mm. Mm. And even, even for the miracles there has to be a preparation, <laughs> a will to mm. accept it. <laughs> the faith, no more than the yeah. faith, the education. So Peral, Peral music has also an educational philosophy well, in, Peral, in, in uh, practical sense. The how, what was it to, to be very a little bit more, more precise mm. uh, in the information. Peral music uh, starts today and uh, uh, you can get it from iTunes mm -hmm. to start with and these are the first the first release are the first three symphonies of Bruckner. Anton Bruckner mm -hmm. the first three symphonies those uh, don't exist in video some of the others do and this are this is why we really decided to put on that and the next uh, what will come out is uh, uh, two piano and four hand recital I did with Marta Arkerich mm. at the Philharmonie. Mm. This will come out first digitally and uh, later on, I'm very happy to say, uh, as a CD also in, in Deutsche Grammophon. Mm -hmm. And then there is a, a educational area. Mm. And you know, I, I, I have to, I get at an age where I, I, I start reminiscing too much and it's <laughs> not necessarily very good. But I was born in a family which was not too well off. Mm. Both my parents were piano teachers. We lived in a small apartment in Buenos Aires. I don't want to cry misery, help me. I suffered <laughs> a lot. Not that at all. But it was not, it was really lower, mid <laughs> lower middle class. Very small apartment. And both my parents taught. So whenever anybody rang the doorbell, it was for a piano lesson. I must have thought as a baby, as a child, that the whole world played piano, because I never saw <laughs> people who didn't play piano. <laughs> no, it's absolutely, seriously, I only started meeting that didn't play piano outside of the family who came to visit every now and then, when I started going out in the street. Mm. And so for me, music was something terribly natural. My mother specialized in teaching children, beginners. She had a wonderful way with them. She was not a great pianist herself. She was not even a pianist, but she was a very good teacher and she had a wonderful way with children. She knew how 
to awaken their curiosity and keep it together with the span of concentration that they were able to devote. They were all four, five-year-old children. And I was very taken by that. And I always followed that. And then when my family moved to Israel, she did the same thing in Israel. And then when I started thinking about Peral and the digital world, I thought, I want to do something for the children too. Because the children who studied already a year piano or a year and a half or whatever it is, and they play not only etudes, that too, but they play little pieces, wonderful music, little pieces of the album for the Jugend of Schumann. There's some lovely uh, Tchaikovsky pieces. I used to play, uh, when I was a, a child, Musique pour enfants of Prokofiev. There's a lot, quite a lot of music. But these children never hear these pieces in a finished way. So I want to record that. Mm. I want to record that and put it out on on uh, Peral, so that the children have the opportunity to hear this uh, music. With a master. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, say hope it. I was going to say, say hopefully say properly played. <laughs> Where does Peral, the name Peral come from? Why Peral music? Well, my name, my name uh, is a Yiddishization of German Birnbaum. Mm -hmm. Then? Eine Birne ist una pera. Una pera, auf Spanisch, peral. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, you, as I said, you are the heart of this project. Uh, it starts with uh, the first three symphonies of Bruckner. Bruckner. Uh, now comes the Argerich. Um, what other repertoire is, is, is planned beyond that and performers, etc.? Well, at the moment, uh, uh, I, th I think we will, we will issue the Bruckner symphonies, mm. all of them, so that the complete, complete mm -hmm. cycle is there. I would like, I make an exception with the Bruckner symphonies, uh, because otherwise I would like as much as possible to issue on Peral, music that I have not recorded mm. in the past. Mm -hmm. um, the Bruckner's, if you want, is a, for me a very special case and it's different because I found um, with the Staatskapelle here a, a very special uh, way of getting into this music. You know, I was very, very fortunate in my life. I recorded all the Bruckner symphonies twice already. Once with the Chicago mm. Symphony Orchestra in the 70s, and, and what a wonderful orchestra <laughs> it was and still is. And then again in the 90s with the Berlin Philharmonic also. What a fine orchestra it was and it is. But I felt with the Staatskapelle, and for instance with the Vienna Philharmonic also, that an orchestra that has great experience with the Wagner operas brings a new dimension to Bruckner, whom, as you know, was so influenced by, by Wagner. There is a certain freedom in uh, uh, the way they can play that, that uh, they have learned from being so accustomed to the Wagner idiom. And this is why when we did them, then I decided to complete them and do the first three, and this is the first So it's, three. A, it's a different reading, you, um, and depending on the orchestra? I think you so, I think so, yeah. I think so. And that would be one of the reasons why... To issue that. But basically, I would like uh, as much as possible to to issue things, uh, that, things have that have not, like the, the duo recital with Martha Arker, which is all mm. new, and all the, the pieces for children that I want to record, I never recorded that. Mm. And um, Maybe people will tell me I should just stick to those childish pieces, <laughs> that <laughs> is possible. <laughs> I should not. Frank Gehry, he designed the logo of Peral of Peral music, yes. how, how did that happen? Because Frank Gehry is uh, designing or designed already the concert hall of the Academy, which will mm. open uh, in two years' time uh, here for young musicians from mm. all the countries of the Middle East, mm. primarily, and mm. of course also some Germans, mm. since it is in Berlin, and it will have a really quite uh, a special concert hall, which will seat up to 700 seats, and Frank Gehry has designed that, 
And in our conversations, I think I told him about my ideas. He's a very, very good friend of mine. And we talked about this and that. And I said, would you ever consider doing the logo? The next day I got it. Oh, that's so wonderful. One last question. Um, in, in our fast times and, and, and use it and throw it, what do we as listeners, in your opinion, gain by sitting and listening, for example, to a Bruckner symphony that lasts over an hour, 70 minutes. What is you our gain? To sit at home, you mean? To sit at home, or to go to the concert, but in this case, to sit at home, to have it and to listen to the, to the cycle. Well, you know, music uh, is a very, very strange uh, phenomenon. Music uh, can be used uh, to forget many things. Just, just think of somebody who gets up in the morning, has already a disagreement with his wife over breakfast, the children are late, one doesn't want to go to school, the other doesn't really feel well and this and that. He goes to the office, the secretary is in a bad mood, he doesn't get any work done, then he goes to his tax advisor <laughs> who gives him very bad uh, news about his tax situation. The lunch is miserable. In the afternoon, he has to go to the dentist who keeps him two hours. And then he finally gets back home at six o'clock in the evening, exhausted and fed up, put his two feet on the uh, table, gets himself a double whiskey and listens to a Chopin nocturne, preferably played by me, of course. <laughs> Chopin nocturne. <laughs> and with that, he forgets all of that. He forgets all of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't believe that uh, Mr. Bach or Mr. Mozart, Beethoven, Wagner, Boulez, Verdi, whoever you, you want care to mention, only wrote this music so that we would forget mm. our unhappy moments of the day. They wrote this music because they have something uh, important to say, a human message to say, and since they were musicians, they wrote these pieces. And therefore, this is the other side of music. And this is the side of music that I think requires, like in everything in life, in music, in love, in, in work, in everything, you only get in proportion to what you give. Mm. Mm. You know that as a wonderful <laughs> singer yourself. And it's the same thing when you listen. I know, for instance, I would never sit at home and listen to music if I was not really in the mood or uh, with the patience and the frame of mind to really concentrate. And I want to really uh, uh, beg all the new listeners who hopefully will come uh, to Peral and will be interested in all that, that they really give me a chance and sit down and listen and concentrate and give the energy of the will to get something out of the music. Well, I'm sure that, I mean, I've had the enormous chance to work with you many times, of course, and to listen to your music, and you certainly always have something very important to, to tell us through your music, not only uh, as somebody deeply committed our times, as I said, but through your music. And I'm sure this, this new adventure will bring more people and I'm sure that people will listen very careful to what you are doing. Daniel Barenboim, thank, thank you very much, much, Maestro. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, as, as Maestro mentioned, uh, Peral Music is a joint venture m uh, with the Universal Music Group. And uh, I will start also uh, the next section, questions and answers, that you will have the time also to, to, to give your questions. But we will start with somebody that I have the chance already to know for many years, and I can assure you is, is a man very um, enthusiastic about classical music, very interested in seeing classical music flourish in the best way possible, and of course, through uh, the recording world. And uh, he's the chairman and CEO of uh, Universal Music Group International. Please welcome Mr. Max Hole. Welcome. 
Thank you, Max, for being here, and thank you really uh, again for for your incredible support and enthusiasm for for classical music. So, why is Peral Music uh, an important business venture for Universal Music Group? Well, I mean. One of the most important things for a record company to do is to support and enable creative people. And, and we've had a, a pretty long association. And as you said at the beginning, um, one of the true greats who not only produces incredible music, but when he speaks, makes people like me want to know more about that music. Um, and and we, we, we meet from time to time, and uh, we, we had a lunch in, in Berlin some months ago. And I love the idea of being on the front foot, that Maestro Daniel Barenboim wants to be on the front foot and be actually doing something that's breaking barriers in music and launch a digital-only label. So I love that. And then also we were talking about the fact that Whilst he enjoys um, a very good relationship with us through Deutsche Grammophon and Decca, sometimes it's a bit frustrating for him because the, the other people are recording certain works and there's schedules and all that. So sometimes he, he can't do what he wants. And so I loved also the idea of, a, <laughs> of enabling Daniel to do what he wants. And, and, and he had a creative idea. So one of the great things about our job is we can make that creative idea come to fruition, uh, and, I, and I think it will be successful. So this is... A <laughs> can I say something? Uh, but about please, please uh, it's your you form. No, I don't want you or, or uh, our listeners to get the idea, you know, that uh, uh, I'm impatient uh, when for some reason something is not possible to at the time. It's not that. It's not uh, a question of impatience. Certainly not uh, uh, ego. Uh, problem is the fact that sometimes you prepare something, with, especially with opera, you prepare something and you do it several times and you feel now is the moment to record it and at that moment it's not comfortable. So yeah. th then it forces me to put uh, Deutsche Grammophon or Decca in an uncomfortable situation of either saying look now no or do it because they want to be good to me and I didn't don't I don't think that this is necessary I think when you have such a healthy uh, relationship as I, I'm very happy that we do it was better to do it like this and if something doesn't work then we will do it and do it and then as we do now with the archerich record and eventually it will come out that too so this is not a problem mm -hmm. and be this being a only a digital label what how, how do you see the digital uh, recording in our days and for the future well y you know you alluded to it when when you, when you came out the the, the recorded music business is in trans transition mm -hmm. and it's in transition in different parts of the world at different speeds uh, in scandinavia it's largely a digital business today mm. in japan it's still largely a physical business mm. and the rest of the world it's all different speeds of transition uh, 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 depending on where you are in the world. But it's coming. It's like gravity. This is the way that um, the consumer likes to enjoy music. Mm. And so um, I think it's very important to listen to the consumer. And I think doing something like this is very exciting because one of the disappointments about the perhaps the MP3 file for the classical music fan has been sound quality. Mm. So th th these recordings will be mastered for iTunes. It se means that they will sound remarkable. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that's really exciting is the explosion of mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, and everything. It, it means that um, this music that's released today, um, people can listen to it in Cambodia, mm -hmm. in Vietnam, in Brazil, all at the same time um, it's available. And a lot of these countries, we never sold anything before. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it's very exciting. Which that brings me to my next question. Of course, the partnership with iTunes, when we're here also in Apple, it's quite something very important, no? creating this synergy, creating these, these partnerships and with different uh, companies. Uh, where, do we, where, where do we stand now? Well, I think, you know, Apple are a very, very good partner for us. They, they revolutionized the digital business. And I think the, the great thing about Apple, who are a tech company, if you like, mm. is there, there are a lot of music enthusiasts at, at, at Apple. 
And my iTunes is run by Robert Kondrick, who is a music enthusiast. Steve mm -hmm. Jobs was a real music enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're very good partners. And in recent times, we've had a lot of discussion with them about the fact that the classical music experience on iTunes is perhaps not as good as it could be. Um, and so we're, we're working closely with Apple to, to make it better organized and make it a better experience. Mm. And Peril's recordings, as I say, will sound fabulous. Is this the uh, master for iTunes? No, that's, that's one of the, uh, to, 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 to make the, the sound quality better, which I'm sure for, for, do you think that fans of classical music are more picky about the sound quality than fans of pop music? Yes. Mm. <laughs> 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 that was a very long answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we're wrapping up. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, but I think the quality, I think the, the questions that you ask, Rolando, are very, very much to the point. The quality, the sound quality, uh, I, I hope, uh, will really be of the very, very best mm. possible uh, quality. Mm -hmm. This, in any case, is the intention. Mm -hmm. The intention is that it will have the best possible quality available today. Mm -hmm. Well, then, what can I say? Yeah, hallelujah. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, more that we have more, more channels, more, more adventures that bring classical music to us. As, as I say, we need to bring classical music to people, not necessarily bring people to classical music, but that classical music is part of our society and our world. And you certainly are doing that. And so I'm very, very happy that uh, I was invited to, to host this talk. And I thank you very much for being here. I thank you, everybody, for being here. And now it's time for you to ask questions to, uh, uh, to, to Max or to Maestro Barenboim about Peral music. I think uh, what you're doing f with this uh, initiative is the future of music industry. And this is exactly what the cultural institutions, music uh, uh, cultural institutions are doing too. Like uh, uh, concert halls and um, museums and uh, nowadays are all the cultural institutions are complex cultural institution and they try to do their uh, audience development programs and do you see uh, you as a con uh, concurrence uh, uh, a competitor with these institutions or rather a friend i don't have competitors I either have people who like me or people who have no time for me. So in, a, <laughs> in, a, in both cases, they are not competitors. <laughs> no, no. But seriously speaking, you know, the main problem, what is the main problem with music is that there is no music education. You're born in a family which uh, there's no, you don't, you're not in contact with the music. The child is born there. He doesn't hear any music. He doesn't see any music being played. He goes to kindergarten, no contact with music. He goes to primary school, to secondary school. He learns geography, literature, biology, mathematics, languages, etc., etc. Not even once the word music is mentioned. Then he goes to university, he's a, he's a very talented person, he becomes a very good lawyer or, or doctor, he comes back to his city, he marries, he has two beautiful children, he's now 32 years old, and he goes to have dinner with some friends in a good restaurant and one of them says, have you ever been to here, I don't know what the, the Staatskapelle Orchestra in Berlin. He says, no, what is that? <laughs> and then says, no, it's a very good orchestra. Da, 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 good this. And uh, it would be very, perhaps, quite nice for you to be seen there at the concert. <laughs> and so he comes on a day when we are playing Schoenberg Variations or something <laughs> terribly complicated. What can he get out of that? Zero. Zero. And that is not the fault of this person or the fault of the young people is the fault of the fact that there is no music education to speak of in the schools at all. And then it becomes worse and worse because then the subsidy of musical institutions is very expensive. Symphony orchestras, opera houses, of course, because they deal only with a small percentage of the population, maybe two percent. Whereas if, the, if one could study about music 
as one studies about geography or mathematics or literature, then probably there would be much more. Therefore, it is imperative, I think, that we do something for, uh, something to provide people who are interested, who, who, or who could become interested in music in other ways, in other, in other channels. And this is what I, I hope to do with this. And I hope not only to find a public that already knows the Bruckner Symphony, I think, but public who might be curious, maybe because of all the things that we have been talking about today, uh, to get involved in this. And I think music, in the end, makes, gives the human being a possibility during the time of the day that he spends with music to be a happier person. Mm. This is basically the main reason. It won't make him a better person. I don't believe in the morals. I don't believe that if you are sensitive to the beauty in Mozart, you will have a better character, you will be a better person. I don't believe in that. But I do believe that if you open yourself to music and try to listen and see what is really that is touching you, that you will spend like this a few very happy moments which you could not spend with anything else. Hmm. This is my belief. Actually, it's, um, I think at, at the end, uh, you, Maestro, you ended up uh, um, answering my question. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm guilty as charged because I'm really this kind of person who um, I don't have a musical education in the sense and I also don't have a lot of the background that I should have in order to be in an opera or, or at the concert hall. Um, the thing is I really enjoy going anyway and not to be there, not to be seen. But uh, this was uh, a question maybe I was interested to, uh, that you took it one step further because for me um, there's also this... Um, um, you, you put. Um, you put it mar marvelously that um, it, uh, uh, music can be used to forget, but I also think there's such an emotional uh, aspect in it. When I go to a concert hall, when I go to the opera, and I am able to see all that, um, I mean, it's, it's splendid. <laughs> Although I don't understand maybe the, the little uh, aspects of it or the, the very uh, subtle uh, changes between an orchestra that uh, is used to Wagner and an or orchestra that it's not. But for me, it's just this, this, this emotional aspect which is so important. And uh, maybe I, you, you, you spoke about it a little bit at the end of your uh, answer. I, I just maybe wanted uh, to hear a little bit more <laughs> about that because I found it really amazing, uh, this Look, emotion. I will tell you very, f very frankly. First of all, I'm very happy that you have this kind of curiosity and that you are able to experience this joy that you always do when you go to concerts or you go to the, to, the, to the opera. I think this is wonderful and I wish there would be more people uh, like you. Maybe there are more than, than uh, one thing. I will not lie to you. If you had had music education and you knew more about harmony and about counterpoint, I think you would get me more out of the music that you listen to. It would be absolute nonsense and uh, um, uh, insincere if I would tell you, don't worry, you don't need that. A lot of people say that. You don't have to just put it on and dream. No. No. You need, you need the will, like we need the will to perform, you need the will to listen. So, little by little, if you have that will and you are interested and you read a little bit more about this or that and things that really uh, appeal to you, even things that are not directly music, uh, connected to the music, but in some way uh, to something that is connected to the music as well. I think this would be, this would be very good, but I think it's wonderful. You have the essential quality to be a really wonderful first-class listener. And if you now, on top of that, read a little bit more about it and find out a little bit more, 
you will get even more out of it. And then who knows, you will then one day come to one of my concerts and tell me why it was not so good. By that time, <laughs> you will know all of that. <laughs> uh, there, we have another question there, and then another one there. Uh, this is a question either for Mr. Barenborn or Mr. Hole. What are your plans for distributing this label to realize this educational goal behind the label? So collaborations with schools, universities, or the digital distribution side, not only through iTunes, but perhaps other platforms. You want to answer that, Mike? Sure, I'll try. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think you know, we, part of what we do, as I mentioned earlier, is we try to enable, encourage artists and artist development. Once we've made the recordings, we then try and communicate them to as many people as we possibly can. And the interesting thing about the world that we're in now is that the possibilities are endless almost, and they're incredibly fast. And so one of the very exciting things about today's world of communicating music is social media and um, uh, how fans communicate with each other and how they can communicate across the world. And, and, and I mentioned one of the things that I love about the, the, the iTunes because uh, we're giving iTunes an exclusive on this for a period of time, is the fact that we'll work with them to promote this all from today, all around the world. Um, and what we do beyond that, we will then expand it to more digital partners. And um, we will try and encourage, as we do, um, people to write about the music, people to talk about the music, people to make little homemade animated videos to the music and put it on YouTube. And, and that's, that's what's so exciting. And I think one of the things, a big challenge for us as record companies is to encourage more people in to classical music. And uh, one of my things has often been, I've discussed with, certainly with Rolanda before, I think it was Alex Ross who said, the problem with classical music is the word classical. And it puts a lot of people off until you play them the music. And then you play them the music and they go, oh, I love this. And, and, and that's part of our challenge. And the digital world gives us a real opportunity to get to more people in more places more quickly. And for the education, if I may add uh, to the, what you say about these uh, pieces for, uh, for children, I think, you know, that uh, uh, the parents and if the children are not too small, the children themselves would be very uh, well acquainted with all kinds of digital, with the digital world and they might want to download or get these pieces and to hear them um, play it as it were, uh, uh, hopefully on a, on, a, in, on a high standard. Hello, I got, um, I got two questions, and both are for two speakers. Um, my first question is, um, what, what, what are the future releases? Because you mentioned Bruckner, you said there, there are going to be two piano recitals um, later. What, what's the repertoire of the label? That's my question number one. And my second question is, um, again, there was the quote today, um, um, you only get of music as much as you give to it. So what does Pearl give to the music, to the classical music world? Well, to answer your first question, the repertoire on the two piano uh, concert with Marta Arkerich is what was at the concert in the Philharmonie in Berlin, uh, uh, whenever it was on East, on East uh, Saturday. There was a, there was a Mozart sonata for two pianos. There is a Schubert variations on the original theme for four hands. And there is the Rite of Spring in the original Stravinsky version for four hands. This is the, the program of the concert. And this will, is what will come out after the, the, the beginning of the, of the Bruckner series. I cannot give you any more precise information about future releases. I hope, uh, I hope to be able to record the um, pieces for children still before the end of this year. So I hope that this will be ready by then. To your second question, 
is not basically I was not talking about what Peral can do for you. It's what you can do for yourself. It's what you can do for yourself in the sense that Peral can only give you the digitalized, hopefully uh, high quality sound that you will get. But you must have the will. You must have the will to sit down and listen and concentrate and see what you get out of the music. Unless you are prepared to do that, you will not get it. It's not music that you listen to while you are waiting for the water to heat when you are cooking in the kitchen. I'm not giving you any nonsense of that that people tell you, you know, you don't have to do anything, just have it and you will listen to it. No, I was hoping that you will find the time and the curiosity to really want to see what is this experience. And Peral will make it, I hope, as easy as possible for you to do that, as Max Hall said, in Cambodia, in New Zealand, or in Berlin. Well, I think with, with that, I would like to, to wrap it up and thank you, everybody. Thank you, ab above all, of course, uh, Maestro Daniel Barenboim, Max Hall, and all of you that were here, and uh, wish you all the best uh, with uh, Peral Music and all the best with all the exciting projects that are happening in Universal and uh, long life to Peral Music with great projects. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.